I, uh, I hope you don't mind, but <laughs> Billy seems to be just really wanting to be involved in this episode of the Vintage Vibe. And uh, I think it's because she loves these speakers so much that we're going to talk about. In fact, probably your favorite speakers to lie down and listen to, uh, a pair of KLH Model 5s. So this is a manufacturer from 1957 that, uh, geez, if you're born anywhere near the 1970s uh, or before, you likely either seen a pair in your you know, uncle's basement or in your parents' rec room, or maybe you had a pair yourself. I mean, I'm a child from the 70s, so I might have been a little too young to buy a pair of KLH at that time. Um, but um, this is a manufacturer that sold 30,000 speakers a year. Yes, that's a lot of speakers. And the company was worth over $17 million when they finally sold. And uh, it was purchased by a couple different companies over the years, including Kyocera. Yeah, that's the ceramics company that got into high five but didn't put any ceramics on the KLH speakers. Uh, and then finally got purchased in 2007 by, um, I think it's called Kelly Global. Yes, Kelly Global. I think she agrees with me on that. So, uh, and they've re-released, as you may know, the Model 3s and the Model 5s. But we're going to talk about the originals today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the speaker itself, what you can expect if you buy a pair in terms of maintenance or service, uh, certainly what it's going to cost to get a pair of Model 5s. Uh, most importantly, how do they sound? I mean, do they live up to the hype? Um, and whether or not you should have a pair in your vintage audio collection. I think she already knows the answer. All that and so much more right here on the Vintage Vibe. Yes, I'll feed you now. Welcome to the Vintage Vibe. Yes, they really are that ugly underneath those beautiful retro grills, complete with Sharpie marks on the speaker cones and on the cabinets. These are like only an audiophile or a mother could love type speaker. Four speakers, three-way acoustic suspension designed in a very heavy cabinet that's got a beautiful oiled walnut finish on it. We're going to talk about these in detail right now. Now this is one of those looks can be deceiving. The heart of it is a 12 inch driver that really has a heavy cone and magnet. The cone is well a mixture of cotton, wood pulps, wool, and believe it or not, asphalt. I mean, we're really talking about putting sound to the pavement here. There's an air spring design for this woofer. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And up above we have two mid-range speakers that are really remarkable miniature kind of versions of the woofer. They've got a heavy magnet assembly in them. They're used actually as full range drivers in the KLH Model 21 radio and 11 phonographs. Um, these speakers um, will surprise you as will this wide dispersion tweeter as well, which is a paper, you know, cone type tweeter. Um, very unassuming, you know, indeed to take a look at these. And I just love the remarkable finish on these. This is a really quality walnut. And on the backs for the critical listener, there's actually a couple attenuators here with selections between low and high for 2,500 to 7,000 hertz and above 7,000 hertz up to 20,000. As mentioned, these are pretty heavy cabots, 44 pounds. And you can hear they're well constructed. They certainly pass my knock test. So KLH, doesn't kind of rely on, like most speakers, the stiffness of the outer edge of the cone. In fact, what they are relying on is kind of an air spring. Because of the acoustic suspension cabinet, um, that stiffness of the speaker, because everything is so well sealed in here, um, not only is the cabinet, like we mentioned, very well made, but the speaker itself, this kind of black you see around this. This is a doping around the cloth surround to prevent air from leaking out. Now, if I was to push this speaker in and it was to hold in and slowly remove out, 
um, it would likely be a sign that there's leakage. And that's something to watch out for if you're buying a pair of these. They should just gently spring back as you touch them with no unusual noises or rubbing sounds, which could be a voice coil problem on these. Um, so the ugliness has a purpose, believe it or not. Now these mid-range drivers I mentioned earlier are used in some of their um, other systems, um, like the Model 21, as a full range driver. Now here, we're not reproducing all the uh, lowest frequencies with this mid-range. That's the job of the 12-inch woofer here. So what we get instead with a more concentrated um, uh, frequency range because of the way they're crossed over is we get some remarkable clarity with this mid-range, um, with these dual mid-range drivers that really makes this speaker very smooth with this bottom end response and the wide dispersion, you know, and, and clarity and mid-range. And you can see the same black kind of doping around these speakers. Again, we need to make sure that these are properly sealed. Now, one other thing I should mention, which is kind of a lookout for as well, is on the edges of both the woofer and the mid-range drivers, there's a kind of a yellowish, yellowy type paste substance. Now that is almost like a doping or a cement. It's how the actual um, uh, cloth surrounds are glued essentially to this aluminum type um, frame that's on these speakers. I think it's aluminum. Could be a, a galvanized metal, quite frankly, but um, that's how it's sealed. So this has to be occasionally reapplied these ones were restored and they were done probably about uh, five years now. And they still look pretty good. I won't touch them for quite a while because they're doing the job right. Finally, the tweeter, as we mentioned, it actually is shaped specifically, um, almost a shell-like shape. And the way it's designed is it's mounted kind of in its own sub-enclosure. And the tweeter, as KLH put it, was responsible for the remarkable clarity that these speakers were able to reproduce in their time. In fact, Henry Kloss believed that the tweeter was far more important to develop that, that good sense of space and clarity uh, in the music that would kind of want to pull you in and make you listen more than, you know, for example, the bass. So these components here are the same components used in, for example, the KLH Model 12. Uh, this was really a outstanding speaker in its time. Now, one other thing to kind of pay attention to, um, as you kind of notice here um, on the previous close-up, we have the same type kind of um, substance here that the tweeter is treated in, but much more difficult to get at it in order to recode it because this grill is kind of glued almost in place. So that I probably wouldn't touch unless you knew there was a problem with the tweeter. Um, now all of these uh, drivers have been also separately mounted with almost like a butyl type substance uh, around all the surfaces to really seal them in again to, to give it that outstanding um, tightness of the acoustic suspension design. That's really crucial. I can't stress that you know um, uh, enough in this case. I want to talk to you briefly about the crossovers because that's another component in these speakers that one has to be kind of aware of if they're going to buy a pair. Okay, so you got a pair of Model 5s. You're going to likely have to clean the potentiometers and test some of these capacitors. Now, thankfully, you've got a lot of space on here to replace if need be, but you're not going to get the maximum performance out of them unless you likely restore and recap. So, some last thoughts with the KLH Model 5s. Now, I want to correct something that I mentioned earlier because it is 2017, actually, that Kelly Global acquired the KLH name. And I think it's now been about three, four years since they've had their uh, own version of the Model 3 and Model 5 out. Now, I will say these are not the same they sound quite different. I mean, they may have retained the spirit of the speaker and the design and obviously, you know, the name, but these are different. And what can you expect to pay for a pair of these? Um, 
Well, I'll give you an idea. I bought these about three years ago and I was comfortable paying the $500 that the owner was asking for them because they were restored and I just thought they were beautiful speakers and I want to have a pair. And I think you can use that as a benchmark for what you may have to pair for or pay for a pair that's in good operational condition. If you can get them less and you're comfortable doing the restoration yourself, go for it. Um, for me, I just found a pair that was, I think, just meant to be. And I don't foresee myself selling these anytime in the foreseeable future. And that's tough for me to say because I've had so much audio. So for these to have a, a place here and, and not be on my list to go anywhere anytime soon, that kind of gives you an idea of what I think about how these sound. They are very smooth sounding speakers, um, but they're not going to put you to sleep. These aren't put on your favorite slippers and it, these will be convincing and, and keep you alert and make your music fun. I mean, keep in mind, KLH and um, uh, Advent, you know, in that period of time in the late 60s, 70s, I mean, they were building some accurate speakers. They really were making some um, big kind of um, pushes forward in the audio world. And the bass on these is, is very tight. It plays very deep. Uh, so it's a convincing bass. Uh, I think they, the mid-range, the bass and the tweeters blend beautifully. Um, I love the fact that they have an attenuator on the back to adjust you know, the the level of the mid and the tweeter because let's face it, your room may be acoustically dead or it could be an active room and to have that option to be able to adjust it really does make sense. Um, I find these speakers, um, again, they play great with both older equipment like vintage audio. Uh, let's say take these and connect a Sansui Model 2000 or 4000 receiver. I had that connected to these before. Wow, I mean, that's a match made in heaven. I mean, they're not a high powered speaker. They don't require a lot of wattage to get them though to uh, convincing levels in your living room. But boy, will you be blown away with how well these play for a pair of vintage speakers. Something that was unassumingly in, you know, your uncle's basement. Um, and they will, you know, play loud and rock it out if that's what you want them to do. But, you know, this was a well-rounded, well-designed, pretty accurate, good dispersion, um, a fair amount of depth. Again, smooth. I cannot stress that enough how smooth these are without going to sleep. So um, would I recommend a pair for your vintage audio collection? I think that's kind of a no-brainer for me anyways. Uh, I really do believe that if you find a pair and you can put them in your collection, you've got a nice receiver to match it with, or even something modern. I mean, these sounded great with my Denon 100th anniversary, you know, integrated amp as well too. I don't think you'll regret it. Thanks for joining us here in the Vintage Vibe, and we'll see you next time when we take a peek at something else vintage. Don't forget to like and subscribe.